a new discovery which has not yet been published. It relates directly to the black communities across America. I'm, after here, I'm going to Bimini. As she said, I'm also going to speak at the Washita Conference again in Louisiana about this. But before I tell you about that, people will say, well, big deal. So what, why is history important at all? History is extremely important. Imagine if, if I could take from each one of you as an individual everything you knew about your life up to last week and just erase it. Where would you be? You, you'd be lost. You, you'd be incompetent. You wouldn't know how to plan for the future. And you do the same thing with a people. If you erase their history or you don't tell enough about their past, they also become incompetent and they can't fulfill the future. And that's why a lot of people in the black community have felt, well, how come all of the dreams of the civil rights movement aren't yet fulfilled? And one reason is because this history is still suppressed. It still isn't taught, but there's been a recent discovery which is going to blow the lid off of all that, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Now, basically, what science has now found, although this is suppressed for the most part, there have been some great researchers. You have some wonderful books here, like by Evan Van Sertema, who's talking about these things. This is not taught in your public schools, although it will be. The history that the children are learning today is not going to be the history that's going to be taught in the next 25 years. It's going to be radically different. We now know for a fact that long before Columbus, there were four major migrations of blacks to the Americas, different parts of the Americas, for totally different reasons, totally separated from each other by many centuries. But nonetheless, there were these black you can call them migrations, but they were not entire. I'll describe them, and you can make up your own mind what they were. The most recent of these took place about 400 years before Columbus was even born, and it's all outlined in a marvelous book over there. It's called The Golden Trade of the Moors. And it is now known that the West African Kingdom of Mali had huge fleets of merchant vessels, and that these kings these black kings of West Africa began sailing across the Atlantic to Mexico as early as 900 AD. Now, why did they do that? They did that for trade, not for conquest or invasion. They did this for trade. Mali was very wealthy in gold. They had lots of minerals. Some of the black kingdoms that were called the Yoruba or the Benin, they were great workers in bronze. But the trouble with West Africa, and it's still a trouble today, not enough food famine. Somehow the black kings of Mali had preserved this tradition of long before where there was this kingdom across the sea, a totally different one. It was very hard to reach. You needed to have uh, excellent ships and good sailors and nobody in Europe was doing it at this time. But if you cross that sea, this other kingdom across the Atlantic was very rich in a certain kind of food which the people over there called maize. We now call corn. And these West African kings launched at least two major fleets, trading ventures, that went across the Atlantic 900 AD to about 1600 AD. And they brought over their bronze work, and they taught the Mexican people, the ancient Mexican people, who were then known as the Mayas. The Mayas had built up a great kingdom of their own, but in 900 AD, they were in decline. They were really on the outs. Nobody knows exactly why, but their society was in decline. They were losing all of their technology. Then this, these black fleets came across from West Africa, from Mali, and they uh, presented a lot of uh, gold work, bronze work, and in return, they came back with shiploads of corn, maize. Now, we know for sure that this actually happened because very recently, you'll see in the next issue of our magazine, not this issue, the next issue is coming out in about two weeks. This is part of the, the discoveries are happening so fast and furious, it's hard to keep track. They now have found that a certain type of maize or corn, which is growing in West Africa, has been growing there for many centuries, is not native to West Africa. It is a type of corn which comes Mexico could have only been brought over by these Mali seafarers over a thousand years ago. So this is a first concrete proof 
that they beat Columbus by centuries and were not just on a voyage of exploration. They were going back and forth bringing corn back. Now, why don't we know about that? Well, this trade stopped abruptly 1600 A.D. 1600 A.D., the Spanish, the Portuguese, run a real aggressive colonizing campaign, and they took over Africa, and they destroyed a lot of these kingdoms. And with the destruction of these kingdoms went all the knowledge and all the history of these past trades. This is a tremendous lesson for us because, you know, we are so proud of our American civilization. We think it will go on forever. But when a civilization falls, history tells us it takes almost all memory of it with it. Civilization is really very fragile. And that's why these lessons from the past are very, very important. If we want to preserve our civilization, we have to learn what happened to these others that crashed. So we know for sure between 900 and 1600 A.D., Long before Columbus was even born, as I say, these blacks were trading, these black kingdoms were trading with Mexico. Um, this, if I have to refer to my notes, it's because this is new to me as well. There's also traditions in Mexico, ancient Mexico, of these black kings coming. And one of them was called by the Mayas, if I pronounce this right, Ekchua, which means the, ba the black calabash or the black gourd. It referred not only to his black skin color, but also this gourd that he brought over. This gourd has been portrayed in these Maya hieroglyphs. This, this guy is portrayed as a West African type of man with robes and everything. And he's holding a gourd in these glyphs. That gourd has actually been identified as a West African type of gourd. So here we're having wonderful proof that there were these contacts between Africa and Mexico. And they actually referred to him by this name. And it shows that the Mayas and these Mali civilizers, these Mali traders, got along really well. It wasn't a conquest. It wasn't one society taking over another. They both had things to offer each other. The Africans had to offer metallurgy and gold, and the Mayas had to offer corn. So there's a wonderful example of, for ourselves too, two totally radically different cultures, separated by a vast ocean, Tremendous cultural and racial differences, and yet they still cooperated and got along real well. So it can happen. But these Mali kings, 900 AD, they set out because they had a legend that there had been blacks going long before them. It was only a legend. It was only a myth. And it was on that myth that they chanced and they went across the sea and it worked out for them. But that myth traced all the way back to an even earlier black contact between Africa and America. And I'm talking about America now, not Mexico, but what we call now the United States. And this relates to this new fabulous discovery that is coming out. About 200 years before Christ, up until right at about the time of Christ, in other words, about 2,000 years ago, there now appears that there were wealthy West African and North African blacks who left Africa on a pilgrimage and came, if you can believe this or not, but there's solid proof for it now, to Southern Illinois. Now I'll explain how that happened. In 1982, our time, there was a, a guy who was going along Southern Illinois. He was a, a cave hunter. And he was, I don't know if you're familiar with Southern Illinois at all, on the Ohio River, it's just honeycomb with caves, thousands of caves. They have not all been explored by any means. And he was involved in sports for hunting in caves. It's done all the time. It's rough work. These, sometimes these caves are very narrow. He went into, to make a long story short, he went into this cave that had no one had ever seen before. And he squeezed through a very narrow entrance, and all of a sudden it turned out into an enormous room. And in this room, he found great sarcophagi, or coffins, coffin lids, made out of stone. The walls are engraved with all kinds of stories, uh, picture stories of men and women in old uh, costumes from the ancient world. And then on the floor, he found stacks of thousands upon thousands of these black rocks that were beautifully engraved with the profiles of people, not Indians, 
people from the other from other parts of the world. Some of them were white, some of them were Asian, but hundreds, hundreds are of black people, all in profile. They are made on a, on a type of rock which is found really mostly only in southern Illinois in caves. This rock is like a clay. You pull it out of the ground and you have like a stylus or a pen and you can, you can draw on it real fast. You can draw profiles and letters and then as it dries it turns into a hard rock and these rocks are piled up on the floor of this cave. Now this man's name is Russell Burroughs. He's not an archaeologist, he's just a, a spelunker, he's a cave enthusiast. He brought these out over time. They're very difficult to bring out because the cave entrance is so narrow. And he's brought out now almost 10,000 of these magnificent tablets. They're very crude looking as rocks are concerned, but the drawings are beautiful. And they show the profiles of black people, some with scarification, which is West African, uh, mostly with not that, some with specifically West African robes, which are still used today. Uh, some will have a man on one side and a woman on the other. Some will be entirely women. It has a, a each one of these 10,000 have a script associated with these pictures. Nobody's been able to translate the script. Well, since 1982, this place has really been contested a lot, but finally some professional archaeologists are involved, some top archaeologists, and they have verified that it is all authentic, and they have dated it now, and there's going to be a lot of information released in the next few weeks and months about this find. Who are these people portrayed in this cave? Uh, not all black, but a lot of them are black. Some of them will show like a, a black man with a kind of a sailor's cap, and in the background will show like a ship or a fish. It seems as though they're portraying a captain or a sailor of some kind. It's now understood, it's very involved, complex. You'll see the whole story in our magazine in the next few issues. It appears as though around the time of Christ, just before the coming of Christ, in Rome, there were a great many mystery cults. And these mystery cults, they were called mystery because they were secret, not because it was a mystery, it was secret. And in order to get into this mystery cult, you had to go through different levels of initiation, like the Freemasons, you know, which are not unrelated to it, believe it or not. There were many mystery cults like this, the cult of Osiris, the cult of Isis, and a lot of other cults we don't know about. And then to get into these cults, we do know you had to pay money, you had to be fairly well off, and the final stage of all these mystery cults, you had to go on a long pilgrimage, a long quest. All that cost money, but you would go on this long quest to a sacred place. And at that final sacred place, you go through an initiation of some kind. And when you went through that initiation, you were finally a member of this mystery cult. And these mystery cults were all the same in that they promised the individual who went through this initiation eternal life. You didn't die. You, you survived after light. And these levels of initiation showed you how your soul made this progression. All that's been lost, although some of it has survived in Christianity, which is basically the same. That you don't die. If you are a good Christian, you go eternal life with Christ. And some of these ideas apparently were shared in common. Now these blacks apparently, they all look, <laughs> they all look well fed. There are no starving people portrayed in this. And they all are with jewels and everything. So they're, they're well to do people. That fits what the archaeologists now think is that these wealthy people, no matter what their race was, but a lot of them are black, would participate in this mystery cult, would cross the sea and come to a cave, this specific cave in southern Illinois was the holy place. It was far away. It was hard to get to. It was extremely secret. It was part of the mystery cult, but they knew about it. Apparently the Romans knew about it. This is like a Roman cult that was open to anybody that could afford to go through it. And they went through their final initiation, whatever it was in this cave. And when they were finished, they had their portraits drawn. It's just like you have your picture taken when you graduated, right? And then in the Catholic Church today, we still have things called votive candles and votive statues. Like you'll go to a church and you light a candle and you leave part of yourself there. Or you have like a statue of uh, the Blessed Virgin or St. Joseph and you'll leave it there. A little inexpensive statue. The same idea seems to be working here. You would go through this mystery cult. You'd come all the way across the ocean on this great hard quest. All the way to southern Illinois to this strange cave. You'd go through these 
rituals, and when you completed them, they would draw your portrait real fast, and put your name on there, and then they would store it in the sacred cave. You didn't take it with you. That's why it's done on kind of crude stone, although the drawings are not crude. The drawings are excellent. And, the and these inscribed tablets were put in this cave because it was like the votive part of you. You left that part of you there. So when you went back to Rome or Africa or wherever it was, part of you was still in this, in this cave. And it is no hoax. It was one time I saw it, maybe it was a hoax, but now they found over 10,000 of these. They're beautifully done. It's, far, it's beyond anybody to hoax this stuff. So there, here's this earlier migration. And because it was part of a mystery cult, it was not well publicized. And so we can kind of excuse historians for saying, well, there were no Romans or blacks or anybody at that time going across the ocean. But there were. The reason they didn't know about it because it was part of this mystery cult. Something of that myth, though, must have survived all the way into Mali times, up into 900 AD, when those kings of Mali decided to cross the ocean. Those two black migrations to the Americas are not the only two. There are two more, two earlier ones still. We go way back in history. Around 1,000 years before Christ, 3,000 years ago, it's such a long time ago, it's hard to even imagine. There were people called the Phoenicians. These were Canaanite people that are mentioned in the Bible. They were half Semitic and half something else. Who knows what they were? They were very well traveled. They were very great seafarers. And they employed all kinds of races on their ships because they didn't really have any particular homeland. They were always traveling, all, went everywhere. They were the first to go around Africa, known to go around Africa, 900 BC. And it's known that they employed many blacks on their ships, not as slaves. They had no slaves on board their ships. But they did have sailors, they did have captains. Captains. These people definitely crossed the ocean also, also to Mexico made a very strong impact on a civilization called the Olmecs. The Olmecs, that's just as a name for this very, very early civilization, the earliest known civilization in Mexico. And everyone thought at one time, well, it's just an Indian civilization until 1861. In 1861, a farmer was plowing his field, came across a, a very strange domed rock, a black rock, and he couldn't dig it out. The more he dug down, the bigger this rock got until he dug the entire thing away. It took him weeks to dig it away. And it turned out that he unearthed a nine-foot-high statue of a head, beautifully done, of an African, not an Indian at all, all the portrayed features of a West African man. From that time until recently now, there have been 11 of these giant stone heads. Let's see it. I'll give you an idea how big they are. Uh, they're an average, well, there's 11 found now. They're between 6 and 9 feet high, and they weigh 40 tons apiece. They're magnificently carved. While these were being found, more of the Olmec civilization was found, and a temple was discovered that had also the same type of people, these West African people portrayed as kings and, and warriors. So when the first archaeologist found these, he says, well, these are probably just blacks that got blown across the sea and were enslaved. But you don't make huge heads uh, portrayed with crowns of your slaves. You know, these were obviously uh, regents, powerful people. How did they get there that long ago? Because those heads are dated to about 3,000 years ago. So far as is known, there was no black civilization then. That came later. It appears that these were sailors and captains working with the Phoenicians. Maybe they jumped ships, maybe they got wrecked, shipwrecked, but somehow they got along fine with this Olmec community, so much so that they rose to become the leaders of that society. One of the other new things that have been found is that the heads, the black heads of these great Olmec kings wear a strange kind of headgear it comes down halfway by the ears and circles the entire crown of the head. There's nothing like that anyplace else until they found, starting to find now, these old leather crowns that were studded with gold and brass that were used by the early kings of Mali. So only two places in the world do you see the same strange type of crown amongst the Olmecs in Mexico and West Africa. So here again there's this parallel. Now, even older than this. I mean, they talk about, you know, uh, our ancestors uh, coming over on the Mayflower. This is, beats them by thousands of years. 
there has been a, another stupendous discovery. I mean, it's, they're coming so thick and fast, probably because our technology is expanding, as you know. And as our technology expands, more we're able to find out more faster. Over in Japan, and this relates to what we're talking about, was found an underwater city, the first ever found. It's right off the coast of southern Japan, by Okinawa, where the Great Battle was fought in World War II. And this underwater city extends for 311 miles on the bottom of the ocean floor. The deepest one is 100 feet, the deepest building is 100 feet, the others are 20 and 40 feet. And they show streets and uh, boulevards, they show pyramids. I've got photographs I'll show you tonight. These photographs are, have not well been publicized, but they will be. Uh, great plazas, huge steps all underwater. Now, this place is probably related to another old legend, and that is of the lost civilization of Mu. Mu was supposed to be a Pacific Island civilization that sank long ago, but before it sank, and while it was sinking, it was not a, a fast or catastrophic end for the most part. While the oceans rose when the ice melted at the glacier. The glaciers that covered all of this area, you know, at one time. 10,000 years ago, they began to melt very rapidly. And when they melted, they flowed into the oceans of the world and they raised the ocean level by about 100 feet. So this civilization goes back maybe 10,000 years. Hard to believe, but the evidence seems to suggest that the city at the bottom of the sea goes back that far. The reason I mention that is because all of the traditions of Mu and all of the research that have been done, has been done into it in our show there were three races of people on Mu. There was a Caucasian people. I'm going to use these terms, by the way, scientifically, not sociologically. This is just to define a people. A Caucasoid people, a Negroid people, and a Mongoloid people. Excuse me, not a Mongoloid people. A brown people. I don't even know how we put them in. And that was considered only legend, only myth, that these three races were on there. They equally shared power politically. The reason why they did it was part of their solar religion. They believed that the sun has different phases of the year, and so they should share power. As the sun shares power with its light on the earth, so these three races had to share power equally. The reason why they believed that was they believed God manifested his power and his identity in natural law, which you see the flowers growing, the sun, the stars. You can't see God, but you can see what God does. That's God's law. So if you live in harmony with God's laws, you see it in nature, you're doing God's will. That's what these people believed. And so by having the sun at different phases of the year, you share different power. Sometimes the whites, the white people, the Caucasoids would be the power. Sometimes the blacks would. Sometimes the brown would. That's their tradition. When this land sank, this high civilization brought some of its ideas to different parts of the world. The brown people became part of what is now Polynesia. And the Polynesian, I can tell you for a fact, the Polynesian legends are thick with stories about Mu. The Hawaiians have a people they call the Mu who were there before they were. The white people apparently uh, didn't do as well physically. They were more or less wiped out or they dispersed and intermarried with people in China, it appears. But the blacks, however, went in two directions. And we this is beyond legend now. Now we're moving into hard science. When Mu sank, or when Mu was in the process of being inundated by this great rising wave of water, they went in two directions. They went out to what is now known as Oceania and became a people known as the Negritos. And they also went towards Mexico and impacted this Olmec civilization. And the reason why we now know that is because there was a genetic trace done. You know about DNA now. That's getting a lot of play in the paper. DNA means you can trace the genetic code of a people. The genetic code of the... And there are, are still native blacks in Mexico. That's never been explained by archaeologists before Columbus arrived. DNA tests done on them. DNA tests done on the bones of some of the Olmec people, not all of them, but the ancient remains, show a definite genetic trace, not to Africa only, but across the Pacific. When they found that out, they said, that's got to be wrong. It just doesn't matter. Oh, there are no black people out in the Pacific, but there's this definite trace, lineage they could trace out towards Hawaii and beyond Hawaii. Then they began a worldwide match of DNA. Well, who does this, who does this 
do these strange black people, who do they match up with? They don't match up with Africans. They matched up with the Negritos in Oceania. It looks now, scientists believe, there was a central point from which they went in both directions. So this is a marvelous heritage. And, you know, some people say, well, you're a white guy. How can you talk about stuff like this? I get flack from this on both sides. The purpose of our magazine is to tell the truth about what happened to our country and our continents before Columbus. And if it shows that there were white Vikings here, and there were, we tell that. And if it shows that there were Asians here visiting, Chinese here visiting Mexico, we'll tell about that. And if there were blacks here, we have to tell that too. That's all part of our heritage. And I think it's, I think it's thrilling and exciting for, for all of us. I th it, it's remarkable. So what we're telling you, I mean, this is just in a nutshell, and you're going to be seeing a lot more of this, not just in our magazine, believe me. You're going to be seeing this on TV. It, it's, it's bound to burst out because it's now it's really known the archaeological community. You've had four of these major impacts that the black people have made to the Americas, not only before Columbus was born, but before even Spain or Italy existed. That's, that's the kind of, of roots that are in this country. And by knowing that, and the more you know about it, it's an empowerment. You're, you're really rude. You you're, have got a heritage which is more than slavery. Sure, there was slavery, but that's not all. That's a small part of it. Long before that, there's a heritage of kings, seafarers, religious missionaries, and they were all here. But it happened so long ago, there's just so little of it left. And, and that's, basically, that's basically my story. Um, the, what connects it up is even the word moor, because it's pronounced differently in different parts of, even of Africa. And they call themselves moor, mu, mur. There's all variations of that, so that even the name Muir, America. I'll leave you with one thing which is really interesting, too, that relates to this. The Mali kingdom, part of their religion, around 900 AD, they believed in a god called Vodun. Vodun or Vodan. And they said Vodan was this great sailor who came across the sea, and he taught the Yoruba and the Benin tribes how to work with metals. And he was their man-god, as it were. He was their, like their founding father, their George Washington, was Vodun. And he brought tablets. He said they brought tablets, which he taught people how to read. Vodun was his name. Vodun and Vodun. Across the ocean, all the way across the Atlantic Ocean, amongst the, what they call the Kisha Maya, or the Lowland Maya that I talked about, they have a tradition of a god they called Vodun, same name, who brought tablets across the sea to tell them how to work metals and so on. So here we're dealing with the same tradition. This is something which is not made up or interpretive. It's the actual fact. It's the truth. So the more of these you have, like I say, the greater the sense of empowerment. So I'm going to stop here because I think these photographs are better than anything I can say. And if you have any questions, you know, feel free to interrupt the action here. Uh, yeah, we're going to have to turn this light off, I guess. This is something I hadn't got time to go into because it's so long, but it's really interesting. This is a drawing from life that was made, believe it or not, about a so-called American Indian. The southern coast of California. He was a member of the Chumash, no longer exist. When the Spaniards met up with these people, they said, these are civilized Indians. They got along extremely well with them. The reason why they got wiped out, though, was because they had no immunity to the diseases that the Spaniards brought over. And so they were all wiped out. This is the last of them about the mid of the 19th, early 19th century. They were a black people who built fantastic boats. They were like Viking boats, believe it or not. They were lab straked over one plank over the other. So they were very resilient in the water. They had a tradition that they did not originate in America. They came from this great island out across the Pacific. And they lived in a number of islands off of California. One of them is Santa Barbara. You've heard of that. It's Santa Barbara. And they called Santa Barbara Limu. That was their name for it. So this man, probably the last of the church, one of the last of the church, represents one of these people from Mu, the very early times. This, these are representations from Ivan Vincertima's book. You've got one of them here. It's excellent. These are one of the old neck heads. 
This is one of the figurines that are found throughout Mexico. What's interesting is that these people are never portrayed as servile or slavish. They're always portrayed as prosperous, as bringing things, bringing metals. Oh, I forgot to mention, too, um, one of, a grave was found in the Virgin Islands of a skeleton that was dated back to about, not too long ago, to maybe about 1200 A.D., but still centuries before Columbus came here. Definitely had a, a, a black skull, negroid skull, and he was buried with an iron tool. Well, according to what we've been told, the people in Virgin Islands had no iron, but the Mali were great iron workers. This is another one of the numerous figurines that were found in, an, in a burial urn with gold and so forth. So it's obviously done out of respect. This is from a place called La Venta, Mexico. It's dated to about 200 A.D. This is a beautiful obsidian ware. It was dark, you could see. This is a beautiful black obsidian which apparently shows a boy bearing, this is not in a servile position, by the way, this is a religious position. This represents the heavens. He's holding up the heaven. There's a mixed tech inscription up here, meaning that this is the sky. So he's not being oppressed or anything. It might look that way, but it isn't. He's holding up the sky. This is dated, while well, they haven't got a good date on it, because you cannot date obsidian, but they did find some uh, material around it, which may or may relate to its date. This goes back to early Maya time, extreme northern uh, reaches of the Maya civilization. This is, represents a person of great influence. This is found on the, uh, on the west coast of Mexico. The name escapes me now, not watch, not um, the west coast of Mexico. I'm sorry, I forgot the, the site. Uh, he's sitting down. He's squatting down. This is the emblem of kingship. He's bearded. The Mayas did not grow facial hair at all. This is another one. This is a terracotta head from about 2,000 years ago. This is from the uh, Atlantic coast. This is around La Venta also. These are what, this is one of the great Olmec heads. And when the archaeologists first saw these, they said, well... They're just typically Indians, you know. And, um, but then people, but then they, they always neglect to say, well, how come the artists who made these always made them out of black bags? You know, if they're Indians, why are they choosing that to work in? And this is part of this helmet, this marvelous helmet, which nobody could understand. There's no other parallel for this helmet found anywhere in the world except West Africa. Plus you have the, and then they said, well, they, they flattened the features so when they carved them, they could move them around without breaking them. And, and, and then it was found that, that they were carved right where they always were. They were never moved. They were, the artists, to, to give you an idea how these things, how marvelous they are, they weigh, they weigh over 11 tons apiece, and they were carried 200 miles. This is before the age of machinery, folks. You know, it's all handy. Whoever got this, they were carried from the Tlaxla Mountains, which are 200 miles away, 11 tons. They were set up, and then they were carved. So the archaeologists were proved wrong again. Some have suggested the reason why there's just heads is because, well, there's two theories on that, although one of these theories is getting outdated now. One, that these were sacrificed victims. Uh, there was a game that the Aztecs called was Tlachtli. And in this game, you had to keep this ball in the air all the time. It's a big, big uh, rubber ball, and the ball represented the sun. And it was played by two different teams. And the team that won the captain of the team, he had his head cut off. Now, the reason why he did have his head cut off was because he was greatly honored that way in, the, in this great victory of getting the ball through the hoop. By having him killed at that moment of victory, it was believed his soul would go straight to heaven. So some people are believe that this is a representation of one of those team leaders. It may or may not be, but that doesn't explain the helmet. So they probably are representations more of kings than of sports figures. This is a fanciful representation, but not that fanciful, of what Mu may have looked like from all of the descriptions. It was a very mountainous place. It was very large. 
more information has come out. There's been a marvelous discovery underwater of something called the Philippine Plate. And it's, a lar it's about the size of uh, Texas. It's under the Pacific, and it was dry land, they figure, about 12,000 years ago, and it's slowly sinking even deeper today in the central Pacific. It was a mountainous land. Their architecture appears to have been very squarish. This is similar to the Olmec heads. The heads may have been placed up high, not just sitting on the ground. They've been placed on things, these gigantic, colossal representations of human head. They were great seafarers. Uh, these are navigable rivers, but they also had a lot of great canals. So this is possibly what this land of Mu looked like. This would be the origin of human civilization. If that's proved, if Mu was the place where a civilization began, well, then, you know, the contribution of blacks not only to America but to the world is profound because this is where it all started. Now, this is an artist's conception, but now we have some real photographs, or we shall. I, I guess I should just run through this very fast. The story is that Mu was prosperous, but, of course, it was on an area known as the Ring of Fire, and that's in the Pacific. The whole Pacific is rounded by severe volcanic activity. And one day this activity was stimulated horribly when you have this tremendous onrush of water into the Pacific from the, the glaciers that are melting. And that started a lot of seismic activity. A lot of volcanism took place on the island of Mu, which was a giant island. And here be a representation of their civilization. They did have turrets, by the way. That appears to be a representation of some of their artwork caused a lot of tidal activity. A tsunami is a, a, a giant tidal wave that's caused by an earthquake. They're actually sea quakes. And the island of Mu may have suffered something like this. The civilization was threatened by the onrush of lava, volcanic activity, and eventually these great waves came and rushed in over the civilization and buried it underwater, smashed it with these great tsunamis. And this is part of the legend now, the fanciful thing of the, the Great Flood, which appears in worldwide myths and covered it completely. Now, in 1995, scuba divers off the coast of Okinawa, just sports divers, started to find some very strange-looking features underwater. Some of these photographs are taken from the Japanese press. It hasn't made much publicity in this country. It's been on CNN, but that's about all. Some of these photographs are taken from a video, others are from the Japanese magazines. And the divers began to find this. This is the first one they found. This is about 100 feet underwater. This is a great plaza, the remains of a, of a stairway, some kind of a walkway. This is off the island of Yonaguni, which is not far from Okinawa. This is part of this great stair. Here's a scuba diver you can see. It's about 100 feet underwater. This is coral encrustation. So they know that it's been underwater a very long time. It's a huge building. It's so big. These buildings are so huge that they're difficult to take in and in with one shot of the camera, especially because underwater your, your visibility is limited, of course. Here's another view of another plaza. It's almost like a section of a pie. It's enormously huge. These are three divers behind there, so you can kind of see. Now, it's in good shape. These structures are in good shape, which means they probably weren't hit by earthquakes so much as when the water just rose over them. And this looks like the remains of Mu, this tri-racial or multi-racial origin of civilization. It's another shot of divers here. These stairways that are underwater probably were for processions because they're very wide. So you'd, we assume that there were dozens and dozens of people in wonderful costumes. And they would climb up these stairs to great plazas where they would hold their rituals. This is to give you some idea again of the size. These are just little divers here. The structure is just enormous. And the people that built this uh, were the people of Mu. And this tradition survives over the course of many centuries. This is a Japanese archaeologist now. and. When this thing was first found, they thought, well, maybe it's a natural formation. But then they did measurements, and they found that all the angles are at almost perfect 90-degree angles, and nature doesn't work that way. So it's been confirmed as absolutely man-made. It has these huge ramparts. You can just walk on these things like for almost for miles. Uh, 
this all looks very, very ceremonial, very, very spiritual, very religious. Our society, you know, if we were wiped out, you come back, everything would seem very mercantile and materialistic and not much would survive. But here, the emphasis seems to be on, on the spiritual aspects a lot. A lot of processional ways for showing off uh, uh, clothing and, and rituals with the gods, ceremonies for the gods. This is another a strange flight of steps that terminates like this. Mostly these are uh, stairways. This is a diver again going away. An enormous block. Now this one is the best I could get of this, but it, this is one of the early pieces that was found last summer. Excuse me, a year ago last summer. It's an enormous arch. It's a gate, and you can see here all the stones are fitted very beautifully. Some of this masonry does, none, does not appear at all in Japan. The Japanese never built anything like this. But it does appear in two places. It appears in Peru, amongst the Incas, and also amongst some stonework found in North Africa, a place called Lixus. So, again, there's some interesting parallels here. This, this is an enormous archway, and here you can see this is a diver on the other side swimming through it. Again, it's too big to fit in the picture. This is again the same plaza. Hopefully we'll get some better shots when we get over there. We're planning our own photo expedition. Or this is the remains of a canal or a channel of some kind. And these little steps here are not to walk on, but to, to facilitate the speed with which the water goes down. So this was all cut on dry land one time. This is for irrigation of some kind. Again, these enormous blocks. Here's the diver here again for size. This is almost like a, an enormous throne here with an armrest. This is a drawing, of course, from uh, Japanese television. This is one of the structures which is so huge it can't be photographed, at least not yet anyway. You have these enormous blocks of stone, this roadway that goes for like about a quarter of a mile across the bottom of the ocean, and then these steps that go all the way to the top. We presume that when this was dry land, before the water went over the top, there were gods, uh, idols, uh, a temple, something like that. And again, this is dated to about 10,000 years ago. This is another... The, the Japanese went to a lot of trouble to make this enormous model. This model is like about 30 feet long. And this shows one section of it, what it looks like. Uh, there's a flight of stairs that goes up. And then there's a long procession away, and there are these two pylons on either side. It's a ceremonial building, a public building of some kind. At the top are these two... overhead view of one of the structures again, basically what it would look like. This is a, a drawing. This is the, one of the models that the Japanese have done. Uh, give you a general idea what it looks like. Apparently, this was natural rock, which the ancients terraformed or molded for their own way, and then they built these platforms on top. This is just a model of a boat, again, for size. And that's all. I just wanted to be able to share that with you. If you have any questions on this, I'd be more than happy to, to try to answer them. And yes, sir. I have a question about the Jeremy Williams arms out. What was that uh, standing up with the uh, structure? Oh, let me just run that back then real fast for you. I think that's probably a model of a boat. Oh, that? Yeah, this is a, a model of a boat. Just uh, 
give an idea for size. This is, yeah, it's about 40 feet long in real life, and this is to show you how big the structure is overall. It appears that there were like houses or some kind of temple foundations on top. They've all been washed away, of course. They were wood, and all that remains is the stone. But uh, who do the Japanese say these people were? The Japanese are say just exactly what I told you. They believe the same thing. They have traditions of Mu that go back centuries or thousands of years. But the real research on the tri-racial aspect of it came out about 1870s, 1876, by a guy by the name of James Churchward, who was a colonel in the British Army. And he spent his whole life researching this before it was found. And he gathered up all the traditions of the Japanese, the Polynesians, and so on. And the theme that came back over and over again was this tri-racial idea of these people. And sometimes, like the Polynesians, didn't even know about whites or blacks, because they were so isolated, some of them in their islands. But they said, that's part of our tradition, that there was this black people who shared power with the brown people who they were descended from. So this is now being accepted by the Japanese, because church word is like big authority on, on move. Well, the origin of human life in Africa goes back long before this. This is the origin of civilization, not of, not of man or of life. That took a long time for human beings to rise up from their earlier beginnings to become civilized. This appears to be where man reached civilization. That it took a long time. It took maybe well hundreds of thousands of years at least. Yes. It's, it's really strange to see these giant steps. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't know about the extraterrestrials, but it's interesting you mention about the giants. Because the, the Polynesians have said about how uh, giants did build these places. And there's all kinds of stories. So I don't know that they were actually giants, but they might have been very, very tall people. That's right. Yeah. These, these, structures, these structures are all oriented east and west. That means that they, they oriented with the rising and setting of the sun. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, you've done good research. Yeah. Well, if you have no further questions, I really thank you uh, for coming and uh, letting me share this with you. I think this is interesting and important stuff, and uh, we're going to be featuring more of it in our magazine. Yes? <sighs> the letters, they look like part Egyptian, they look part Phoenician, but they're not. They look kind of Phoenician. They look kind of Egyptian. Now, some of the letters are Egyptian. You can translate s words, but you can't translate a whole sentence. So it's like a mix of, of something. But they haven't figured out what that language is on those plates yet. It looks Egypto-Phoenician. The plates are all being held by Mr. Russell Burroughs. He is the discoverer of the cave. And uh, he has them all warehoused and... Uh, well, he sold some. He sold some to uh, professional uh, investigators who've done tests on them. And it was important for him to do that because these investigators have proved that they're authentic. If he had just kept them, you know, people say, well, maybe you made them, you know. So they've been uh, thoroughly tested and found they are, are real. They're real in the sense that they are ancient, that they were made 2,000 or more years ago. And um, so all this is going to be coming out soon. It's coming out on our magazine, the next issue. That's gonna, we're not going to be the only ones that are covering it. It's going to be, uh, there's a television special made now. It's going to be out early next year. It's called uh, The Mystery Cave of Many Faces.
At least that's the name they're using for it now. The cave is located in southern Illinois. Pardon me? Uh, he has not disclosed exactly where because he's afraid that people will go in there and destroy it. But it, he just told us it's, a, well, it's around Olney, Illinois, if you know where that is. Olney, it's like, okay, let me give you an idea. It's like uh, 120 miles southeast of St. Louis. Yes, sir. Well, I think that uh, there's all kinds of political reasons in, involved. People have all kinds, their own personal agendas, and I don't want to really talk on that because I don't know what, you know, why they would not want to share this. The only thing I know is that there's a new generation of people coming up now who are open to the possibility of people from Africa, especially from Mali, who came here and did great things. Well, so it's coming out. I don't know. I don't know. The government is very hard to second guess, you know. So uh, our opposition, or the only opposition we found to this, it really comes not from the government, but from old-style archaeologists. Uh, the reason why is because an archaeologist can't make much money by themselves. Archaeology doesn't pay. The only way you can make money being an archaeologist is to write a book, and you go to class, you, you have a, teach, a class you teach, and you make all the students buy your book, see. And, and your ideas are in that book. And if somebody comes along and says, oh, no, uh, there was somebody here before Columbus, then he's going to object to that because he doesn't have that in his book. See? So there we're getting resistance from these old-style archaeologists. But uh, they can't stop it now because it's, it's too well documented. Yes, sir? Well, I think some of these secret societies, I mentioned like the Masons, for example, the Masons have known about some of this for a long time, but they keep it all to themselves as part of their lodges. And so now some of the stuff is going to be public knowledge, so it'll be interesting to see how they react. Well, I don't know. I, I, I can't That's say that. Asking. Yeah, I, 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 I don't think I can answer that authoritatively. I'm just a reporter. I'm not a political scientist or, or an archaeologist. And, uh, my job is to, just to get this stuff out. Well, I've got to be honest about it. <laughs> okay. I didn't think it was that much, but I know that there have been traces of blacks found in China. And that also is suppressed or just not publicized at all. But I never heard of, of a number quite that huge. And that the Chinese knew about it like for many, many years. Yeah. But you, that's part of the migration from Mu through the Pacific, it appears. Yes? No, not in, in the islands of Japan so much. But the, it's an interesting point that the, the Japanese people represent you know, a homogeneous race. But the people on Okinawa, they're racially different. They're racially very, very different. And uh, they don't even speak the same language. The people on Okinawa don't even consider themselves Japanese. So it looks like there's some other influences at work there over a very long period of time. Something. Yes, ma'am. Um, it looks that way. Yes, 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 right. See, there have been legends about this civilization before Egypt, but no proof. But now, with the DNA testing, with these structures found off of Japan, there's a lot of indication that what we're looking at is, in fact, Mu. And also, just to study the legends of the Polynesians, where they talk about it. I mean, you don't have a myth that survives for hundreds or thousands of years without having a kernel of truth behind it. And... All these are just different pieces of a puzzle which are coming together. So yeah, Mu looks like the first civilization. It does. 
Atlantis? That's a, that's a whole other subject. I, I would even, can't even begin to get into that now. <laughs> maybe, maybe another lecture, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I'm kind of focused on this. Well, I think what you, a valid point you bring up, we are taught in school that the earliest civilizations are e Egyptian and uh, Mesopotamian, that nobody came over to America except Columbus. I think these are all outdated ideas. We're going to find that there were many people here before Columbus and that there were several civilizations be before Egypt, that those people got their ideas from places like Mu. Maybe Mu isn't the oldest. Maybe there was some even before that. I don't know, but we do know this is before Egypt. Uh, I would not rule out Atlantis or even other places we don't even know about yet. I, I, I try to, I like metaphysics a lot, I'm interested in it, but I try to keep it separate from this. Yeah. The fifth. Yeah. Right, right. That's uh, Madame Blavatsky and the Theosophists. Well, you're you're ahead of me there, I think. <laughs> yes, yes. Right, very interesting. That's the end of something big will happen. Oh, he, they just had, he just had a, a thin wire that okay, held it up, that's all. Yeah, sure. They didn't want to show that. That's what I wanted to know. Are you sure they had the wire? Yeah, yeah, you can see it clearer on the video. I just took this off the video there. Yeah, he wasn't levitating his ship or anything. All right, yeah. <laughs> so. Okay. Well, any other questions? Well, again, thank you very much for allowing me to share this with you. And uh, the Washita also is going to be carrying some of this in their newspaper. Right, right, that's when it first came out, and now all this new material, we can hardly keep up with it, so much new stuff.